important place to get <laughs> care for older people right from the beginning. And I've been working with colleagues in Leicester, Jay Banerjee, Mark Williams, therapists, nurses, some of whom, many of whom are in the room today, to try and build a service in the emergency department that is frail friendly or uh, is suited to the needs of older people. We still have a long way to go, a long, long way to go. Um, but I'm going to reflect upon here some of the, the learning, if you like, over the years and place into context, hopefully, the talks that you've had this morning. So this morning we covered a, a wide range of topics, all relevant to older people, but a common theme amongst those, hopefully that you would have identified, is that this is all about managing complex people in a complex and time-pressured environment. And this, as you've heard from our speakers, from both the UK and Europe, is a, an issue that we face not just in Leicester, not just in England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, but in the whole Western world. So this is, this is a core business for all uh, acute hospital staff and related agencies. And you've also heard how important the ED is in terms of establishing the initial diagnosis, providing the immediate care, and how that sets the tenor, sets the trajectory sets the, um, the ambition and the uh, influ heavily influences the outcomes of the remainder of the patient journey. Of course, emergency departments manage an undifferentiated population with a wide range of people, from paediatrics all the way through to resuscitation uh, patients. And one of the things that we're particularly interested in is trying to identify that subset, that population of older people um, with specific sets of characteristics that make them especially vulnerable to, uh, to harms, whether they're admitted or, or discharged home. So we'd like to talk a bit about how we go about risk stratifying that population, because the elderly don't exist. They are not a homogenous population who all look the same and all have grey hair and all have <coughs> nasty outcomes. You've heard from all the speakers today, actually, the population of older people, some of whom have frailty, uh, are very heterogeneous and uh, one of the key work, uh, roles in the ED is to try and identify those older people at the most risk. So it's a, a risk stratification process. And I think if you walk into any hospital in any country, I suspect, and you walk into their emergency department, you'll get a feel for how well that hospital is working or not. The ED is a pulse check, that what goes on there is a pulse check of the whole hospital, which is why, love it or loathe it, the four hour standard exists. It's an integrated process metric that reflects how well the whole system, the whole hospital and the broader system is managing patients and patient flow. So when I talk about the system, this is what I'm referring to, okay, so the ED as part of a broader system. This is obviously quite simplistic, but just to remind us that the system includes not just the emergency department, which is this area down here, but it involves the pre-hospital assessment, whether that be through the paramedics, the GP, intermediate care teams, or community rehabilitation teams. It involves the rehabilitation services, whether they be bed-based or home-based, that provide care for people pre-hospital or following their uh, admission and, and, and transfer out for ongoing rehabilitation. But it also involves, importantly, all the inpatient beds and what goes on in specialist care, in surgery, in oncology, in uh, orthopaedics, wherever it might be. So this is what we mean by the system. This is the, the broader catchment population feeding into an urgent care uh, environment. And the reason we need to remind ourselves about the importance of the system is because according to an analysis from Monitor, so for those not familiar with Monitor, this is one of the sort of large over, um, overarching NHS regulatory bodies that is responsible at least in part for measuring how well hospitals are performing against the four hour standard. So an analysis from Monitor using hospital data um, alluded to the importance of the whole system in uh, terms of the impact on the uh, four hour standard, this integrated process metric. And the blocks in green here are thought to have relatively little impact on the four hour standard from a, from a sort of high level perspective. So there's not a lot you can do about who's turning up. 
the best admission prevention schemes might reduce admissions by 10%, maybe 15%, but that's still going to leave 85, 90% of people still requiring acute hospital care. So there's not a great deal you can do here. The A&E is only as good as its outflow. You heard how, how difficult it can be to manage older people, particularly those with a um, cognitive impairment in the uh, emergency department, not the A&E, sorry. Um, and yes, there'll be some people that can go home from emergency departments, but not everybody. You know, even our, you know, the best early supportive discharge teams based in the emergency department might increase the proportion of people going home by a 10% or so. It still leaves the bulk of patients, particularly this old, older population with multiple comorbidities, <coughs> cognitive impairments, etc., who are going to require admission. So there may be some mileage in looking at the conversion rates or the proportion of people admitted from emergency departments. But the bulk of the flow that impacts upon the emergency department comes from the rest of the hospital, from the base wards that uh, determine whether or not there are spaces in the system in the emergency department for, for people to flow through to. And to a, uh, to a lesser extent, monitors, monitors you, and I think this will be borne out by the research evidence as well, is that pathways out of hospital uh, contribute a small part, but probably not as much as people say. So if you speak to acute hospital staff, they'll often say, oh, we can't get people out of hospital. And there's some truth to that. You know, we have to wait for this continuing care assessment. We have to wait for social services. And that's all true. But a lot of that is at the very end of the patient pathway. So we have this dreaded measure in, in the UK, the delayed transfer of care measure. So how many people are medically fit, whatever that means that are waiting for a social care package or something. And that might account for 2, 4, 5% of patients, something of that nature. But that's right at the end of the patient pathway. And one of the key things is actually what happens in the hospital, both in the emergency department and in the acute unit and the base wards thereafter, that is it has a potentially massive influence on the, the outcomes of the patient, both from a clinical perspective, patient outcome, and from a, from a service and sort of resource use perspective. So what does good look like? How do we know when we've got a system that um, is catering well for the needs of older people with frailty? Um, and you could argue that a lot of these principles apply to all patients, but my interest and for the purposes of this talk will be focusing on older people with frailty. But I work with a, a team called the Acute Frailty Network who have left the room, it looks like, <laughs> because they've heard it all before. But we've come up with some suggestions as to what good looks like, because no system's got this right. There's nowhere in the country, and I've been to 20 or 30 different hospitals up and down the country in recent years. We've <coughs> um, had the oh, good fortune to visit some centres across Europe, um, and nowhere's got this right. But we think that these principles outline some of the characteristics of what a good system would look like. I'm just going to run through those in a little bit of detail. So the first thing, as I alluded to in the first slide, is to establish a mechanism for identifying the population at the highest risk. There's a big debate about which tool to use, and for those interested, the sensitivity and specificity of a wide range of tools for use of, used to identify a high-risk population in ED tends to cluster around the sort of 0.7 in terms of the area under the curve score, apart from Dr. Moyart's tool, which is even better than everybody else's. But everybody <laughs> else's tool is better than everybody else's anyway. So, but, so there are tools, they're all good, but none of them are perfect. And actually, even the perfect tool is only as good as how acceptable and practical and implementable it, implementable it is in clinical practice. And Amy uh, Elliott is one of our BSc students have done some lovely work looking at the acceptability of frailty screening tools uh, to emergency department staff. And what they value most is, yes, they want a good evidence-based tool. They want one that's easy to apply, that's quick and simple. And you can see here we've tested four common frailty tools, so something called the Clinical Frailty Scale, and we can rock called the ISAR, which is popular, Prisma 7, which is less used, I think, in emergency care, and the Silver Code, which is slightly older, but again used predominantly in North America. <coughs> And we found that they were all broadly quite quick to complete, so less than a minute. And the, the staff, when asked if they would use the, the tool again in the future, tend to prefer the ISAR um, um, or the CFS or the Prisma, but less so the Silver Code. 
the, the details of this are, are not so important as recognizing that unless you have a tool which is you know, quick, simple, and easy to use in the emergency department setting, it's not going to get completed. So no matter how good it's predictive property, if, you, if you're not, people aren't using it, it's not going to influence care. So uh, we, we encourage systems to use simple rules. There's a complex patient in a complex system, and you need simple tools and simple rules to govern uh, patient pathways. The purpose of identifying, in this case, uh, risk in terms of frailty is so that we can at a tailor or align the clinical response to try and improve outcomes. And for older people with frailty, the, the best evidence-based response is to use this technique of comprehensive geriatric assessment. And you've heard how difficult that can be to implement in an emergency department setting. But that doesn't mean that you can't start to think about these patients holistically. The point about older people with frailty is that they won't just have medical needs, they will have cognitive needs, functional needs, social support needs, environmental needs. And unless we start assessing the patients in that holistic way, from the minute they arrive in the hospital, we'll start to uh, we'll come up with care plans or treatment uh, plans that miss important parts of their overall, um, overall being. And so the idea is that we would then screen for frailty, identify those at risk, and then just do some deeper dive for common geriatric syndromes such as delirium um, so that we can identify it. As you heard, current EDs are not doing that well. So this will be a prompt to, to identify frailty, falls, risk, polypharmacy, whatever, and then activate the team to start getting involved in, in, in managing these patients. So these are the domains of CGA. There's lots of resources available online if people want to read more about this and we can circulate those uh, to you after the conference, but the, the key point is it's a holistic, multi-dimensional, patient-centered assessment about uh, trying to improve and, uh, and deliver coordinated care, both for the initial treatment but also for ongoing follow-up. So in the ED context, you screen for frailty, you identify that there's some cognitive impairment, you think it might be delirium, and you can put that in your plan, and then that can be followed up either in the acute setting or in the community if you're feeling that the patient can go home. But if you don't identify it, it's going to be missed and there'll be trouble. Um, so we've heard already that surgeons don't want to do this. ED physicians, some of you will be interested in doing some of this. Who's going to take responsibility for delivering this holistic care plan? Well, we've got, uh, fortunately, we work in multidisciplinary teams and, and um, Many of you will be familiar with physiotherapists, occupational therapists, nurse specialists working in emergency departments up and down the country to try and bring together this holistic assessment and coordinate it and wrap it around the patient. Doing that in ED is tricky, it's not impossible, um, and just involves um, you know, careful coordination and communication. It's much easier to do these things on a unit or a ward base, but you can, you know, there's nothing to stop you speaking to your primary care coordinator, your, your nurse navigator, your therapists that seem to be needing to, to come together with a, a clinical management plan that addresses the multidimensional needs of the patient. Not easy, but possible, but then if it was easy, we'd be doing it all already. So this is about moving to a different paradigm, a different way of doing things. And we had about trauma calls this morning. So the silver phone there is the geriatric equivalent of the trauma call. Yeah? So we heard about how when they hit the trauma call, all the team come rushing in and peel off as necessary according to patient lead. The silver phone concept is why, why don't we do this for older people with frailty? These are often the people with the highest mortality, the highest morbidity, the worst outcomes. And yet our response to them historically has been certainly different from that from a trauma, trauma call. Variability is the enemy of patient care. Um, and these graphs are quite small, but the jagged lines basically tell you about variability. In this case, we were looking at multidisciplinary team meetings on what we call our emergency frailty unit, which is a sort of dedicated uh, area for the care of older people in the emergency department. And this was looking at the composition, so the, the who's there, and the frequency of multidisciplinary team meetings, and through a process of quality improvement, measuring what we did, looking for change, uh, we managed to drive up the consistency of those meetings. So it, this isn't to say we're trying to um, control clinicians or take away clinical autonomy. This is about, as a team, how do you work together? When, when do you meet? How often do you meet? 
Who's going to be there? What's the outcome of the meeting? These are internal clinical professional standards that allow people to work together efficiently and effectively to improve outcomes for patients. A random system that doesn't have structure, that doesn't have coordination and communication, no matter how brilliant the geriatric assessment or how fantastic the OT assessment, if you don't bring that together and coordinate and communicate it, it's not going to improve patient outcomes. This is one example of how to go about in, um, reducing variation in, in internal professional standards. So that involves measurement. The next slide's a bit scary. It's not mine, it's one of my colleagues who's a quality improvement guru. But it does introduce the concept of measurement. And we're really bad, certainly in my hospital, and I think in many across the country, at measuring what we do and the impact it has on patients. Deep breath, because it's a busy slide. Whoa, there we go. <laughs> That's uh, odd. Um, so the busy slide, I'm not gonna talk you through, be pleased to hear. What this is intended to represent is how relatively simple things can be measured. You know, we, we kind of turn up to a, work, a day at work and all of a sudden there's 25 older people with frailty and six of them have got delirium and the other seven have got hip fractures that haven't had uh, their nerve blocked on or whatever it might be. And we kind of act slightly surprised as if, well, this is a bit weird, isn't it? I came into doing 20 year old men on both motorcycles uh, with trauma. Um, so we don't measure the patients coming through our system. We don't, as a rule, some places are better than others, know who our customers are, what their needs are gonna be, where they're gonna go. We don't plan our capacity accordingly. So we heard Mr. Norwood talking about surgical patients. And I said, there's a clear example of a mismatch between the team that's providing the care and the needs of the patient. You know, if we measure that and then start to work on improving the processes, re uh, distributing, if necessary, the resources in order to be able to respond appropriately, or implementing the education and training to encourage our other colleagues to manage these people in the way that's necessary. We'll have a better system. So you can measure the volumes of patients. You can work out the kind of uh, the average plus 80 uh, percent, you know, the, the variation. You know that 80 percent of the time you're going to have 20 people, 15 to 30 patients that need multidisciplinary team triage in this case. You're going to know how many blood tests, this, that, and the other. There's very few places that do this systematically, and yet it's so logical. And if we were in a business or any other setting, this sort of thing would be being done all the time. So if the whole hospital is the problem, if, and the whole system can also help, how do we go about building a community of practice, create that cooperation, the collaboration that's going to work around and improve patient care? And, and this is tough because, as you heard from several of our colleagues, people feel um, unprepared sometimes for older people with frailty. They don't have the knowledge, the skills, and sometimes the behaviours or attitudes that are necessary to manage this population in the way that we would like to see, for example, following the principles of comprehensive geriatric assessment. So people are working on how to develop whole hospital solutions to deliver CGA in this population, much of which pins around identifying the population, describing what their needs are, and working out the competencies required to deliver those needs. So that it doesn't all fall upon geriatricians or geriatric services, because there's, the mismatch is too big. Everybody will be familiar with the demography. You know, there's never gonna be enough specialist geriatric teams to manage all of these people. Everybody's gonna have to take their responsibility. And I guess, in a way, uh, today is an example of that movement, if you like. So putting in place appropriate education and training for staff, encouraging, in this case, emergency physicians and emergency teams to equate themselves, become familiar and more confident with the skills necessary to manage this population. So education training is a really important part of how we're going to move forward and address, address the, uh, the numbers. <coughs> What's wrong with this picture? The clinical change champions. Apart from the graphics aren't very nice and they're slightly dated and give away my age. <laughs> Absolutely. So the concept, the, the traditional model of a clinical leader is this heroic person, Superman or Wonder Woman, leading from the front, driving every, you know, getting all the troops motivated to follow behind and showing everybody which way things will be done. That's not how it works. That's not sustainable. It won't, you know, it lasts for a certain period of time and then eventually people run out of energy or 
they disenfranchise their colleagues because we need to develop this collaborative leadership approach. You can't make change at the scale and the pace necessary on your own. And a hallmark of geriatric care is multidisciplinary team meeting. A hallmark of improvement is multiple multidisciplinary team working. We have to take people with us on this journey uh, in order to develop sustainable change uh, that, will, that will meet the needs of this population. Dave's been kind enough to sponsor us today and provide his expert acting talent, but of course, a core member of the multidisciplinary team, this community of practice that will take forward uh, change and make it sustainable are the patients and the public. And listening to them is critical. We've had some very insightful comments through all of our speakers, including Dave today, about how important it is to make sure that what we do is collaborative and patient-centered. <coughs> And then finally, just talking about the difficulty of sort of uh, maintaining momentum and project support, you've got to get your system, so if we think about the hospital to start with, involved and engaged in this issue. The bulk of bed days, if, if you care about nothing else other than resource, the bulk of the bed days are taken up by this population. Therefore, the bulk of the efficiencies are going to come from managing this population efficiently. So this needs to be the core business of your executive team, um, and needs to be project management <coughs> supported in, in, a, in a, a kind of structured way. It's you know it, it, you can't just have a, a group of enthusiastic uh, enthusiasts that will take forward and deliver this work. You need to have some uh, rigor, project management, and senior support uh, to make it happen. Because if that's not there, when difficult decisions need to be made, uh, you won't. You, you will sometimes lose. So having that senior buy-in is really really critical. So there's a summary. Uh, ten principles. Uh, we're working through these with our colleagues in the acute frailty network. We think they kind of make sense from our perspective. Uh, we would encourage you to think about some of the things that we've uh, highlighted here and have a go at putting them into practice in your centre. Thank you very much. Thank you for an excellent talk there on um, systems and services in GDM. Do we have any comments or questions from the room? Oh, one now I'm in trouble. <laughs> no, you're not in trouble, Mr. Okay. Um, I'm also just using this opportunity to showcase some of the different ways of working that we're looking at less than one in Feral Me, working in very closely with the um, acute assessment areas and the to unit, and that is through um, a meaningful activity service yeah. who um, is actually, with are spreading out a little bit more to ED as well, and that team is dedicated to support patients with dementia through complex investigations um, to help the, the patient journey, I don't like that term, but the patient journey and that helps clinicians um, through assessments, like blood, lots of things, as well as improving patient experience and the and so, um, and I think that's impacting the inpatient wards as well as yeah. the emergency. So, no, thank, thank you. Is that I, right I, I should have had a slap for not mentioning. So, so the meaningful activities coordinators in, in Europe they might be called play therapists. That's I know it's not quite what the terminology we use here, but some of our colleagues may recognise that. They're amazing. You know, you walk up, we have a, an acute frailty unit, an emergency frailty unit, which is full of nearly everybody on those wards with either delirium or dementia. And yet you walk through that ward and the patient, the, the, the atmosphere, the ambiance on that ward is, is calmer than the acute sort of medical units where the bulk of the population are cognitively intact. So that there's definitely something there about the, the, how the meaningful activity coordinators help the staff on the wards manage these patients.